This evening we're going to uh, open up the book of Exodus, unsheathing Exodus. Genesis ends in a graveyard with the death of Joseph, but Exodus ends with the glory of God coming down on the tabernacle as God's people are in the wilderness and following his leading and guiding. It is a fundamental book. It has uh, just powerful teaching and, and powerful descriptions of God and who he is and what he has done. When we talk about the book of Exodus, I think it's important for us to understand that this is a title that human beings beings put on this particular book written by Moses. Uh, this is the second of five books of Moses, the Pentateuch, and uh, the title that we use today in our English Bibles, Exodus, actually comes from the Greek translation of the Hebrew Scriptures. Uh, the, the Jewish people knew this book by a different name, and uh, for the Jewish people, Shemot, the, the book of Exodus begins this way in Hebrew. Uh, it, it starts out, uh, these are the names, the Ela Shemot, names, that's what this word means. These are the names, the names of the individuals whom God brought through the, uh, the time of trial into the land of the promise. These are the names. And uh, with those few words, this book begins. And in Exodus, we see God moving in a powerful way to save his people, to uh, deliver them from bondage. But more than that, what we have in Exodus is something that we see throughout the Old Testament scriptures, throughout the Hebrew scriptures. And that is as God moves in history and as he reveals himself, there are profound instances where he makes himself known in ways that are just absolutely overwhelming. At the same time, those things always seem to point to an even greater reality. In the case of the book of Exodus, we have the story of Israel's deliverance from bondage in Egypt. But it points to an even greater deliverance to come, and that is the deliverance that will be affected by our Lord Jesus Christ. And so as we look at this book, even as we look at all the Hebrew scriptures, we look at it with the expressed intent of seeing Jesus clearly portrayed in its pages and in its events. And that will become, I think, very obvious as we go through this this evening. Now, a, a couple of things ought to be said right at, up front about this book, and that is that there is controversy surrounding the book of Exodus, or the book of Shemot, names. And, and the controversy is, is primarily a chronological one. Many people, including some very devout people, differ on when these events took place. Many other people, very religious people, question whether those events ever took place at all. I will tell you this, I believe they did take place. I believe that what we have recorded here is actual history. I, I believe these are events that took place in time exactly as they are described in the scriptures. I also believe that we need to take seriously what the Bible says about when this occurred because it does greatly impact the way we look at the rest of scriptures. Uh, what has happened in much of the Christian world and even the Jewish world in recent years is that many people have questioned the traditional dating of this book and the dating of these events. And they have tried to, uh, to make sure that what they teach goes along with what secular historians are saying. As I hope to demonstrate, at least in part this evening, much of what secular historians are saying about these events and these times uh, often has no basis whatsoever in actual fact or actual evidence. And uh, quite honestly, many times people ignore the evidence that is found in this book and in other writings of the Old Testament uh, just because they either choose to or they don't realize it's there. But once you see it, it's some pretty powerful stuff. And, and so first off, I'd like to tackle the dating issue issues very briefly. If we follow a, a clear, clear expression of the, the Hebrew scriptures, it, it's pretty easy to date the Exodus. Um, many ancient dates are very hard to pin down. Uh, we have in our history books, you know, such and such what happened at such and such a time. But very often people have no real idea of how slender the thread of evidence is for many of the traditional dates of various events in antiquity. There are only a few 
particular times that we can say, yeah, categorically, this is when that occurred. When it comes to the Exodus, we seem to have one of those, those cases where it is clearly defined in a way that we can count it down and say, yep, that must be when it happened. And uh, to see that, it's important to take a look at the book of 1 Kings chapter 6, verse 1. Uh, in 1 Kings 6, verse 1, you wanna, might want to hang on to Exodus, but uh, turn to 1 Kings 6. And uh, this is what we read. This is during uh, the reign of King Solomon as uh, he is building the temple, the temple that his father David had wanted to build, but that uh, God had said, no, it's not for you, Dave. You've got too much blood on your hands. It will be for your son who will be a man of peace. Anyway, in 1 Kings chapter 6, verse 1, we read these words. In the 480th year after the Israelites came out of Egypt... In the fourth year of Solomon's reign over, over Israel, in the, ninth mo- in the month of Ziv, the second month, he began to build the temple of the Lord. And, and in that one verse, we have a clear description of when the temple was begun in view of how many years after the exodus that building began. Now, in the case of King Solomon, we have a pretty good idea of the years of his reign. And the fourth year of his reign, historians are generally of one mind that it was the year 966 BC. We have some some solid anchors that we can base that on. By this description here in 1 Kings 6, what it means is the exodus taking place 480 years earlier would have occurred in the year 1446 BC. Now, that has been the traditional date that biblical scholars and devout Bible students, Jewish and Christian alike, have adhered to. Uh, In more recent times, however, that has come under quite a bit of scrutiny and has been rejected by many, including much of Hollywood, I might add. Many of the biblical epics... For instance, the Ten Commandments with Charlton Heston, you know, a classic. Uh, Charlton Heston portrays Moses, and, and everything that is described in the book of Exodus is treated with respect. But there are some editorial decisions made in that movie. And one of the decisions is this. Moses lived in the time of the great Egyptian pharaoh Ramses II, or Ramses the Great. Quite frankly, from what we know of Ramses, of the length of his reign, and uh, what, we, what we speculate on with Egyptian chronology, uh, Ramses comes far too late to be the pharaoh of Moses. But the way that is, a, is arrived at is on the basis of one verse in Exodus 1. Exodus 1, verse 11, which uh, reads as follows. So they put slave masters over them, meaning the Israelites, to oppress them with forced labor. And they built Pithom and Ramses as store cities for Pharaoh. Uh, Today, there are many Bible students and teachers who will point to that verse and say, see, the, the Exodus must have taken place at the time of the great Pharaoh Ramses II or Ramses the Great because his name is mentioned here in Exodus chapter 1, verse 11. And surely they wouldn't have built a city named after Ramses before Ramses was even born. Ramses lived in the 13th century before Christ, uh, approximately 200 years after the traditional dating uh, of the Exodus. And the reason many have gone with that is because A, Ramses is mentioned here, and B, it fits in with the prevailing understanding of ancient chronology that is held by many historians and by many people who study archaeological artifacts, especially pottery. That view is widely held in Christian circles and in non-Christian circles, that if the Exodus did indeed take place, it took place during the time of Ramses. What they fail to recognize and acknowledge is, number one, Uh, There is a growing body of evidence that would suggest that Ramses may not simply be the name of a pharaoh. It may be a place name and a name that was widely used in Egyptian society long before there was ever a pharaoh of that name. Secondly, it ignores the possibility that our dating system that is widely accepted in the 21st century is wrong. 
and is mistaken. And you will notice between these two dates, there is a gap of approximately 200 years. One thing that has captured the attention of a number of historians and archaeologists over the last 30 to 40 years is that 200-year gap is something that we see elsewhere in the ancient historical record. And what it may imply is that our understanding of history is off and could be off by a couple hundred years or more. And here is what's at the heart of it and at the root of it, if I may. Egyptian chronology is the chronology that is used to date most of the ancient world. And because we have Egyptian records and because scholars have been so fascinated with Egypt, our chronology of antiquity is pretty much based on ancient Egypt. Basically, our understanding of Egyptian dynasties, even the understanding that there were 30 Egyptian dynasties, all rests on the writings of one Egyptian priest who lived approximately 250 years before the time of Jesus. His name was Manetho, and uh, he is the one who defined the uh, 30 different dynasties of ancient Egypt, who wrote uh, a description of the great kings and history of Egypt. The problems with Manetho are, number one, we don't have most of his writings. They, they have disappeared. We only have excerpts of them. Uh, number two, he was writing with an obvious agenda. And as Manetho wrote, one of his agenda items was to make sure that Egypt had a history that surpassed that of the Greeks and of the Hebrews. And uh, there is much in what we have of Manetho that causes many who have studied him to say, you know, we need to be very careful here. Uh, it, it's the only information that we have of any, any substance, but we need to evaluate this rather carefully before we proceed much further. If you go to a bookstore today and uh, want to find out a listing of the pharaohs and when they ruled, you can pick up a number of good books on ancient Egypt, and you will find, uh, as you pick up one of those books, you'll find a neat chronology of the pharaohs, and, and it talks, uh, you know, about the pharaohs of uh, each of the dynasties and the intermediate periods and gives you all sorts of dates and looks nice and tight and, and it will look that way until you buy the second book because when you buy a second book you'll find quite frequently that the numbers don't seem to jive between the two and sometimes there are some rather substantial differences, not just difference of a year or two, but, but very substantial differences. And, and you find that the old kingdom and the middle kingdom and, and the uh, new kingdom and the first and second and third intermediate periods, uh, they, they don't always jive in these lists. Well, there's a reason for that. And that is there is still a good deal of information that we are lacking. And uh, what has happened is that today there are some, some brilliant scholars, particularly in England, uh, starting about 30 years ago, who began questioning the chronology that we're using today. And one of the reasons they began questioning it is because since all chronology is based on Egypt, what we found is there are these dark periods in the histories of a whole bunch of ancient peoples. Because we are forcing everything into an Egyptian chronology, when you study, for instance, the ancient Sumerians, you find out that they had a period of about 200 years or so when nothing seemed to be happening. And you study the, the ancient Greeks and you find there is this dark period in, in Greek history where for about 200 years nothing seemed to be happening. And then as we came to, to know about a civilization that no one even believed other than Bible students up until the 1900s, and that's the Hittites, you find out that from what we read in the Hittite records, there seems to be this 200-year period where nothing seemed to happen. And finally what happened is a number of historians and scholars sat down and said, wait a minute, maybe what we have here is not dark ages in uh, each of these civilizations, but maybe we have arbitrarily said, well, they must have had a dark age, they must have had a dark age, they must have had a dark age, and maybe the answer is really, we've misunderstood Egyptian history. And by the way, if that is true, and there's some very powerful evidence to suggest it, it also answers many of the objections to the biblical narrative. 
And let me just use one classic illustration, and that is the illustration of Jericho. The Battle of Jericho took place 40 years after the Exodus. According to the biblical record, Joshua and the Israelites crossed the Jordan when the Jordan stopped flowing up at Adam. They uh, surrounded the city of Jericho, marched around it for seven days. On the seventh day, they blow the trumpets. They shout, the Lord has given us the city. The walls fall down. The Israelites move in. They conquer the city. They completely destroy it and burn it to the ground. That's what the Bible has said for 3,500 years. When archaeologists began working in the site of ancient Jericho in the early 20th century, what they discovered was radical. John Garstang in the 1920s and 30s began excavating Jericho, and he discovered as he dug through these ruins, wow, this city fell not just fell to an opposing power, but the wall actually fell. And it fell outward, just as the Bible describes it. Not only that, but what he uncovered in the ruins was a testimony to what we read in the book of Joshua chapter 6. And that is, the city was burned and the wealth was burned with it. One of the things that Garstang and others saw that just astounded them is the, the remains of grain in storage bins in the lower levels of the city. Grain was precious in the ancient world. It was the equivalent of cash. And whoever took this city torched the grain. That's exactly what's described in the book of Joshua. And so in the, the 1920s and 30s, when these these findings started coming out, people said, there, that proves the biblical record. But then along came the 1950s, and another brilliant archaeologist by the name of Catherine Kenyon reevaluated what Garstang had done. And uh, she came away from that maintaining, well, yeah, the, what he saw is indeed accurate, but it's not at the right time in history. And as a result, today it is widely held that uh, Jericho was you know, it was uninhabited at the time when the Israelites are alleged to have come in because they came in far later uh, than, you know, the city was at its prime. However, when you uh, go back and reevaluate Egyptian chronology and do it with the chronology of other ancient peoples, all of a sudden it compresses time. And what happens is that Jericho falls at exactly the time the Bible says it did around 1400 BC. I believe that what we read in the book of Exodus is real and true. I believe that what we will discover and have discovered and are discovering in, in the remains of ancient civilizations has, will, and is confirming what we see in the biblical record. But I also believe we need to carefully make sure that we're not just simply accepting what others have said without critically examining it. And, and it's here that I believe the biblical record is one of the most underestimated records in all of antiquity. There is nothing like the Bible in, in terms of describing in detail events that took place. It is not portrayed in hearsay fashion. You read some ancient historians and they say, well, I heard it from so-and-so, or there's a rumor that goes around. Instead, it says, in such and such a year, during the time of so-and-so, on the 12th day of the fifth month, and, and so on. The, the scripture really is very, very methodical in the way it lays things out. And uh, as a result, to that, I believe that what we have here in Exodus is real, genuine, and true, and is absolutely life-changing. Now, there is something that's worth noting, too. In the book of Exodus, Pharaoh is mentioned frequently, but his name is never mentioned. We have no, no record here in Exodus of the name of the Pharaoh. All sorts of speculation has been made. The Jewish historian Josephus posited one particular explanation. Uh, many theologians and, and historians have suggested others. Uh, personally, I believe in light of the evidence that we have to date, it is still a guessing game. But what we see the Pharaoh doing is very consistent with what we know of the ancient Egyptians and of their rulers. They believed their Pharaohs were godlike beings. They, they believed that they were very religious people 
And, and the book of Exodus is directed as God reveals himself, not only to the people of Israel, but also to the Egyptians, showing them that their gods are false and that there is only one God, the true God. As we go through the book, we come to the story of one man in particular who is at the heart of, of this book and, and in the heart, really, of what follows in the, the Pentateuch, the five books of Moses. And that one man is Moses. Uh, we're told that he was uh, born of a, a family of Levites, people from the tribe of Levi, one of the uh, 12 sons of Jacob. The Levites would later become the priests. We are also told the name of his father and mother. We know they had at least three children. Of the three, Moses was the youngest. Uh, we know that his brother Aaron was three years older than him. We know that his big sister Miriam was older still. And uh, what is described in Exodus 1 is a series of events that took place after the death of Joseph. Two weeks ago when we finished up the book of Genesis, we, we ended with Joseph being second only to Pharaoh in Egypt and the Israelites, the children of Jacob, being warmly received into the land and given the best part of the land, the land of Goshen right up here in the Nile Delta region. But what Exodus tells us is that after Joseph's time, there arose a Pharaoh who did not know Joseph. And at that point, the, the children of Israel found themselves being on the outside looking in. Originally, they were welcome guests. Now they were illegal aliens. And, and that's really the picture that we have here because the Egyptians look at them as they begin to grow and multiply. And the words that are used here in the opening chapter of Exodus, they remind you of what we read in Genesis when God created our first parents. He told them, be fruitful, multiply, and fill the earth. Well, listen to what Exodus says. Language very, very similar. Exodus chapter 1, uh, verse 7, it says, But the Israelites were exceedingly fruitful. They multiplied greatly, increased in numbers, and became so numerous that the land was filled with them. As, as the Israelites, they grow from a, a group of 70 people who came with Jacob down to Egypt to, to see Joseph. They grow in number until we get to Exodus. There are 600,000 men, not counting the women and children. Uh, approximate population, 2 million people from 70 to 2 million in a matter of several hundred years. And so you can understand how the Egyptians would have been rather uh, fearful of this group. They're, they're not like them. And uh, what they say, what we read in Exodus is, what if our enemies come against us and the children of Israel turn against us and support our enemies? We're cooked. And as a result, an order is given by the Pharaoh, and the order is this. From now on, any children born to the Israelites, uh, midwives, kill the boys. You can let the girls live, but kill the boys. And we're told that two of the midwives in particular, Shifra and Puach, uh, they refused to do that. And they were brought up on charges. They're brought before Pharaoh. And Pharaoh says, what's going on here? Why aren't you killing the, the baby boys? And, and their answer was, uh, it was inspired. Pharaoh the, the Israelite women aren't like Egyptian women. By the time we're called to assist with the delivery, they've already had their babies. And, and there's nothing we can do about it. They, they, they are healthy specimens. You know, they're not like those wimpy Egyptian women. I mean, they have their kids quickly and they're done and there's nothing we can do. And it says God blessed those uh, midwives and gave them families of their own. But in the midst of that, the Pharaoh gives an order, and the order is keep killing them, kill those boys. And so Amram and Jochebed have a child, a son. And uh, when Jochebed saw Moses, she, she realized this kid is unique. And so they, they concocted a scheme to protect him. 
We're told that they made a basket, coated it with pitch, put the baby in the basket, and then set the basket in the, the rushes along the edge of the Nile River, and then sent Miriam, Moses' older sister, out to watch the baby and make sure that nothing happened to him. What's fascinating is the word that is used for basket here in, in Exodus is the same Hebrew word that is used in Genesis 6, verse 14, when God says to Noah, I want you to build an ark and coat it with pitch on the inside and out. It's the same phraseology, but the same word that we have here in Exodus. And I don't believe that is accidental. I, I mean, let's be honest. The author of the Bible ultimately is God himself. There are no accidents with God. Everything he does is deliberate, is intentional, is brilliantly planned. Our God is truly brilliant beyond our ability to even comprehend it. And for someone reading the Hebrew scriptures, especially for the first time, what would have struck them is God once commanded one of his followers to save the world by building an ark, coating it with pitch, and putting his family and all living creatures inside. And now God is going to save his people by an ark coated with pitch through which he will protect a deliverer who will save his people. Uh, there are no accidents here. Anyway, Moses is discovered, as you'll read in Exodus, or have already read, and discovered by, of, any, of all people, Pharaoh's own daughter. She decides, here's a boy that I can have as my own son, and uh, I need somebody to raise him so that I don't have to do the dirty work. So she talks to the little girl who was near the basket and says, uh, could you find someone who might be able to uh, take care of this child, nurse him and uh, raise him, and when he's old enough, uh, bring him to the, uh, the palace? And uh, Miriam says, well, I think I can find someone. I, I, I know a woman who could do that. And so she goes and gets her mom, Moses' mom, and says, this woman can take care of him. And Pharaoh's daughter says, great, I'll pay you. Don't you love that? Uh, you, know, uh, you know, motherhood is, is uh, you know, such a precious gift. Um, and how neat to actually be paid to do what you were willing to do for free. And how good God is. Now, we look at that and say, oh, well, just take care of him until he's weaned. That's not long. Well, it's not long in the U.S. of A. in the 21st century. But in the ancient world, and still today in much of the world, uh, weaning does not take place in the first few months or even the first year of a child's life. Children are nursing when they are three years old and four years old in much of the world, and that has been true throughout the ages. And so what would have happened is that Moses would have been raised by his own mom and dad and would have been taught the truths of God's word. And little children, they, they internalized so much. Moses took it in, and even though he would later be raised as an Egyptian, he never lost his heart for God and never lost his heart for his people. Now, we know a bit about Moses from Exodus, we also have some rather tantalizing clues about him from other authors. One in particular is, is especially noteworthy, and that is the Jewish historian Josephus, Flavius Josephus, who lived shortly after the time of Jesus, uh, latter part of the first century. Josephus tells us in his Antiquities of the Jews that Moses was actually in line for the throne. And that more than that, he was actually at one point in his early life a general in the Egyptian army who led an attack against Ethiopia. According to Josephus, Moses was an accomplished tactician and a brilliant soldier. Now, the Old Testament doesn't give us that bit of information. We don't know if that's indeed true. But Josephus is a, a fellow who has, has given us an awful lot of material that is trustworthy and, and is, is true. And, and so it, it's worth considering, at least. What we do know is this. By the time Moses is 40, he has a passion for his own people, and it gets him in trouble. He ends up killing an Egyptian. It gets out. The Israelites are not willing to accept his leadership, and he has to flee for his life.
At that point, we're told that Moses fled from Egypt to Midian. And here it's important for us to take a look at the map. This is going to uh, come back to uh, uh, tantalize us a little later on. Uh, today, scholars around the world are pretty much in agreement that Midian, ancient Midian, is this area right here, which is modern day Saudi Arabia. <coughs> now, most people accept that without a whole lot of questioning. But there are some other implications once we accept that. Traditionally, it is believed that Moses met God at Mount Sinai, located somewhere around here in the Sinai Peninsula, part of modern-day Egypt. But if you take the scriptures literally at their word, Moses was in Midian when he went to the Mount of God, to Mount Horeb or Mount Sinai. And if that is indeed accurate, and our understanding is accurate, it means that Mount Sinai is in Saudi Arabia. By the way, that jives with what we see in the New Testament. In Galatians chapter 4, the Apostle Paul talks about Mount Sinai. And uh, he says Mount Sinai is in Arabia. I believe that has some very fascinating applications for us. One of them is just purely historic. Wouldn't that be amazing if Mount Sinai is located somewhere other than where we've traditionally believed? And you say, oh, but isn't that traditional view an ancient one? Actually, it's not as ancient as most people think. The view that Mount Sinai was located down here uh, in uh, the southern part of the Sinai Peninsula has only been around, as best I've been able to track it, for about 1,700 years. And the person who was instrumental in setting that as the site of Mount Sinai was none other than Constantine, the Emperor Constantine's mother, Helena. Uh, somewhere around 325 or so, she said, well, that's the spot because it was revealed to her. That was the spot where Moses uh, met God in the burning bush and took the Israelites to receive the Ten Commandments. Uh, what is fascinating about that is in 1967, after the Six-Day War, when the Israelis conquered all of the Sinai, Israeli archaeologists went to the traditional site of Mount Sinai and did quite a bit of excavating. And they did that with the intent of, of uncovering evidence of Israel's dwelling there, camping out there for over a year. They found absolutely nothing. And uh, in all honesty, the physical setting of that place does not seem to match what we have in Exodus when it gives us the description. Uh, we'll come back to that in a little bit, but I will raise one other thing, and that is if Mount Sinai really is in Saudi Arabia, in the heart of the Islamic world, there have been some recent findings that have come out that would suggest this could be dynamite, uh, theological dynamite because there is actually some rather, uh, rather compelling physical evidence that would suggest a group of a couple million people camped out here and actually worshipped a golden calf here. And, and not only that, but you can see the remains of their campsites here. And, and there are some physical evidences of water flowing out of a rock on a temporary basis, uh, it, it's, it's pretty amazing stuff. The difficulty is for Westerners to get in there uh, requires you either to put your life on the line or is absolutely impossible. But just the evidence that has come out is enough to make you say, wow, we need to look at this. Among the things that we have been discovered there is a mountain that seems to match the biblical description that is charred at the top uh, fire somehow coming down upon it, and uh, around the bottom of it, there is a huge campsite area. There are the remains of 12 pillars built around the bottom of that mountain, just as the book of Exodus describes, and uh, there are also some ancient petroglyphs, carvings, and among the carvings are carvings of a calf as an object of worship in a place where there traditionally have never been cattle. Um, you know, it makes you wonder. 
So we will come back to that in a bit, but I'll just dangle that out there for a second. Let's move on now in the story of Moses. So by the time we get to Exodus chapter 3, Moses has fled Egypt. He's living in Midian, and for the next 40 years, this man who has been given the best education in the world at that time, an education by the Egyptians, uh, now takes care of sheep. He serves as a shepherd for 40 years, uh, hardly what you would call uh, an exciting and uh, you know, challenging job that offers you new opportunities every day and, and uh, strange, uh, strange and uh, growing opportunities for advancement. It, you know, it's same old, same old all the time. But Moses is learning by taking care of sheep how to shepherd the flock of God. And at the age of 80, he goes to the mountain known as Horeb or Sinai and sees something that just captures his attention. It's a bush on fire. But what is so unique about the bush is it's burning, but it's not being consumed by the fire. As Moses gets close, he hears an audible voice say, Moses, take off your sandals. The ground on which you are standing is holy ground. And for Moses... It is an, a life-shattering experience. You know, so often when we read the Bible and, and see events like this, where God intervenes in a person's life and uh, confronts them in a dramatic way, our reaction is, wow, that's neat. But in reality, what we see in Scripture and what we see in history is when those things happen, it is usually devastating for the individual involved. It, it, it brings you to a point where you say, whoa, you know, God is far more than I ever expected. This, this just, this unhinges me. This, this challenges everything I believe and understand and everything I accept. And, and Moses is faced with that. And God says, Moses, I've chosen you and I want you to bring my people out of bondage in Egypt. Well, Moses has one excuse after another. I mean, it, if, if it weren't so real, it would be comical. Moses responds, well, God, I don't even know your name. And God responds, Exodus chapter 3, verse 14. A yeah, a share, a yeah. I am who I am. I will be what I will be. And, and Moses is overcome by this. And, and, and immediately Moses comes up with another excuse. He says, well, well Lord, I, I've never been eloquent. I, I, I have difficulty talking in front of a group. And Moses gets a zing in on God with that one. Please take note of that. He says, I've never been eloquent, not before and not since you talked to me. <laughs> hint, hint, you know, this hasn't made a difference there, Lord. And God says, I will give you your brother Aaron, and he will be the one who will assist you, and he will speak to Pharaoh. And then Moses comes up with the ultimate explanation of why he can't do this. Moses says, I don't want to do it. And the Lord says, you go. I've called you, you go. I will give you the tools that are necessary, but you go. And at that point, Moses, as it's related in Exodus, goes back to Egypt, meets his brother Aaron along the way, and has another dramatic encounter with God. And it's there that I'd like to camp for just a few moments here this evening. If you would turn in your Bibles to Exodus chapter 6. Exodus 6 is one of the most important chapters of the Scripture, and it's also one of the most overlooked. Exodus 6, we read the following in uh, Exodus 6, verses 2 and 3. And I'm actually going to put those up here on the screen. We read, God also said to Moses, I am the Lord. I appeared to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as God Almighty. But by my name, the Lord, I did not make myself fully known to them. Now, the word translated, the Lord, is a single word in Hebrew. It's called the tetragrammaton, which is a fancy way of saying four letters. Tetragrammaton is Greek for four letters. This is the Hebrew name God gives to himself. It appears over 6,000 times in the Old Testament. We don't know how it was pronounced. The way that many suggest today is 
Yahweh or Yahweh. Uh, some others have suggested on the basis of some manuscript evidence that has only recently been uncovered that this may have been pronounced Yehovah. A friend of mine who is working with an Israeli scholar, a Dead Sea scholar, Dead Sea Scroll scholar, is firmly convinced that's the way the name was pronounced, Yehovah. Now, in the Old Testament, God says, you will speak my name to the people of Israel, and you will pronounce blessings on them in my name. But we know that the Jewish people for the last 2,000 years or so have not spoken that name. And from some of the evidence that we had during the latter time of the second temple, the, the temple that was there when Jesus was uh, living and crucified and risen, during that time there is some evidence that suggests only the high priest would speak the name, and only on the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur. Um, what is said here, God says to Moses, I am Yehovah or Yahweh. I appeared to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as God Almighty, in Hebrew, El Shaddai. But by my name, Yehovah, I did not make myself fully known to them. And many people have looked at this verse and said, this doesn't make sense. Because all through the book of Genesis, God calls himself by this name. And he speaks to his followers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, and he declares his name. How can it be that he didn't make himself fully known, as the NIV translates it, to them? And the answer most likely is this. Keep in mind, the Hebrew language is a very vital, active, powerful language. It is not the language of a philosopher that, where you just sort of sit back and speculate. It's all about action, about involvement, about things happening in powerful ways. The Hebrew word here translated fully known, the Hebrew word to know is yada. But to translate it merely as know in English does it an injustice. In Hebrew, to yada to know means to understand and experience something. It's not merely a matter of head knowledge. I know that two plus two is four. It's rather, I have experienced two plus two. I had two male cats and two female cats, and together they produced four offspring the first time, and then it just kept on going. You know, it's an experience. It's more than mere head knowledge. It is actually personally experiencing what is going on here. And so what God is saying is, I revealed myself to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. But by my name, as the God who keeps his promises and keeps his covenant, I did not make myself fully known to them. They just had a glimpse of what was to come. You are going to see it all. And that's what happens in Exodus. We behold God's glory. We behold God's power. We behold God's nearness. Uh, he, he is an active, intervening God. And, and that's what he's telling Moses. And through Moses, that's what he's telling the children of Israel. If you think of it this way, God told Abraham hundreds of years earlier that his descendants would be slaves in another land for 400 years. They would, they would be living in, for 400 years in another land and would ultimately be slaves. He made it very clear that he was going to give them the land that he had promised Abraham. But Abraham died without ever seeing that. Abraham only owned the burial site of his wife. And, uh, you know, he had no other property, really, that was his. But now they're going to experience God keeping his promises and his word. And they will know him as Yehovah, the one who is, who really does keep his promises. And that's just stamped all over the pages of Exodus. Well, as we go on in Exodus, we see something else. And one of the big things we see is in this same chapter. In fact, just a few verses later. Again, if you've got your Bibles open to Exodus chapter 6, take a look at verses 6 and 7. 
for Jewish people throughout the centuries, these have been two of the most important verses in all of the Bible. For Christian people, they ought to be some of the most important verses in the Bible, but by and large, the Christian world has pretty much ignored these words. Here they are. Therefore say to the Israelites, Exodus 6, verse 6, I am Yahweh, Yehovah, and I will bring you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. I will free you from being slaves to them, and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with mighty acts of judgment. I will take you as my own people, and I will be your God. That is the promise God makes to the children of Israel. And it's on the basis of those two verses of Scripture that the Jewish festival of Passover is based. Because in the Passover, for the last several thousand years, the Jewish people have used a series of four cups in celebrating the Passover meal. Exodus tells us about the origin of the Passover when God delivers the, the Israelites after a series of 10 plagues. But here in Exodus 6, we have the origin, whoops, the origin of the four cups of Passover. The Jewish people today, the Jewish people in Jesus' day, the Jewish people during the times of the kings, they celebrated the Passover and celebrated with four cups. The first cup was called the cup of sanctification. Uh, sanctification in the sense of God setting us apart for service to him. And, and so that first cup, God says, I will bring you out. I am the one who reaches in. This is not something you achieve on your own. It's not something you did in your own power. I came in and I set you apart for myself. Cup number two, it was called the cup of wrath or the cup of plagues. I will free you from the Egyptians. And how does he free them? With a series of 10 plagues. Cup number three was called the cup of blessing or the cup of redemption. I will redeem you. And what will God do? He will redeem them through the blood of an innocent lamb who sheds his blood for the people. This is the cup, by the way, that Jesus used to celebrate the Lord's Supper. And we know that because of 1 Corinthians chapter 10. It says, Paul writes, the cup of blessing which we bless, is it not participation or communion in the blood of Christ? And what Paul was saying is that Jesus used that third cup. In Jewish tradition, there are two basic traditions here. In Jewish tradition, the fourth cup is always poured, but not always used. There are some Jewish people even today who do not drink the fourth cup. But even those who drink it recognize it talks about future fulfillment. Jesus celebrated the Passover and gave communion, as we call it, with the third cup. But as he gave it to them, he says, I tell you the truth, I will not drink the fruit of the vine again until it comes to fulfillment in the kingdom of God, until I drink it with you at the time when everything is put together. That fourth cup was called the cup of praise or traditionally Elijah's cup. And since the Old Testament prophets end with Malachi saying that Elijah the prophet will return before the time of Messiah, Elijah's cup was always seen as the fulfillment of all God's promises. Jesus in saying, I'm not gonna drink this again until it finds its fulfillment in the kingdom of God, is saying, the next time I'm with you, it's going to be a celebration that will last forever because that'll be the fulfillment of all things. And we already see that here in Exodus. The fact of the matter is, Jesus is stamped all over the pages of this book. It, it, it's amazing stuff. Well, it's after this, then, that God intervenes in powerful ways in the lives of not only the Israelites, but also the Egyptians. And what we see happening is a series of ten plagues that impact first Egyptians and Israelites, and then only Egyptians. The plagues go like this. The first plague, the plague of blood. God tells Moses and Aaron, go to Pharaoh, say, let my people go. If he doesn't, then do the following, and the Nile is going to turn to blood. 
and it does. And the reaction of Pharaoh is his heart is hardened. He refuses to go along with it. Not only that, but his religious advisors and magicians, they are able to duplicate this. They too can turn water into blood somehow, some way. And uh, so the next plague comes, and that's the plague of frogs. Of all the plagues, this one is kind of my favorite on a personal note because it's just so creepy, you know. Uh, can you imagine uh, the, the plague goes like this? All of a sudden, frogs are everywhere. And keep in mind, all of these plagues, they are not just physical phenomena. They are religious phenomena as well. Because the plagues not only bring financial ruin on the Egyptian empire, but they devastate Egyptian religion. The ancient Egyptian people were incredibly religious. They worshipped a multitude of gods and goddesses and, and worshipped also things and animals. Among the deities that the Egyptians worshipped was the frog god. And so now, these frogs that the Egyptians hold as, as sacred, sacred frogs, you know, are coming out of the woodwork, and everywhere you turn, they're frogs, and to make it worse, they're dying, they're dropping over like flies. And the Egyptians are shown the very things we worshipped are now smelling to high heaven. The next plague changes everything, and that's the plague of gnats. Up until this time, the Egyptian religious advisors and magicians were able to duplicate for Pharaoh the very things that Moses and Aaron had said and done. But now when the plague of gnats come, the uh, magicians say, hey, we're not able to do this. And they say, this is the finger of God. Love that line. This is the finger of God. The next plague, the plague of flies, has another wrinkle. For the first time, the plague will only impact Egyptians and not the Israelites. And God says he will send these flies, but he will exempt the land of Goshen. After that, the plague against the livestock, and again, only the Egyptian livestock are afflicted by the plague, not the Israeli or Israelite livestock. The plague of boils, have you ever had a boil? Hail that destroys crops. Locust, the worst locust plague, according to Exodus, the worst loc locust plague in all of Egyptian history. And now the Egyptian economy is really on the rocks. Then the ninth plague, the plague of darkness. This one is particularly ominous. Exodus describes it as a darkness you can feel. But for the Israelites living in Goshen, it's all sunshine. <laughs> and then the final plague, the plague of the firstborn. And there the firstborn of Egypt dies. From the firstborn of a lowly prisoner in an Egyptian cell to the firstborn of Pharaoh. In a night, they're gone. But the Israelites are told their firstborn will be preserved if they do the following. And this is where we're going to end tonight. Exodus 12, verse 22. We read this. Take a bunch of hyssop, dip it into the blood in the basin, and put some of the blood on the top and on both sides of the door frame. Now, God gives here a very clear description of how they are to do this. Egyptian homes, there is little rain in Egypt. And uh, they would dig a small trench in front of their doors so that if rain suddenly did come, it wouldn't come running in underneath the door but would fill the trench. The word saf in Hebrew describes that basin or that trench. They were to pour the lamb's blood there. They were to take a stalk of hyssop plant. And as it's described here in Exodus chapter 12, they dip the stalk in the blood. They smear the blood on the top and on the sides of the door frame. And if you notice, what they're doing is making the sign of the cross. Now you might say, well, that's a really interesting thing. Isn't that a coincidence? And I would suggest there is nothing coincidental about it. God gives clear direction. This may be, by the way, why the Jewish scholars who copied the Dead Sea Scrolls 
When they copied those, they marked the passages that referred to the Messiah with a cross. Now, this is before the time of Jesus. They are marking those passages that refer to the Messiah with a cross. And it may go back to the Passover because they were saved when the blood was placed on the door frame, the cross piece, and the uprights, just as Moses had instructed them. They would have been making the sign of a cross. Um, God has such wisdom. He is giving us a picture all the way through, and it will not stop here, but that's where we need to stop. So we will pick up there next week. <laughs>